All right. Hey, good to see everyone. This is Father Ian Van Heusen here with Alana. What we're going to be doing in the coming weeks is um, just with our time is to kind of do some reflections and to kind of create that digital retreat experience for folks, something they can meditate on and to meditate on scriptures. Today, we're going to be focusing on the flight of Egypt, and we're going to be looking at the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2. Uh, oops, sorry, burping a little bit there. I have a little bit of my Diet Coke. This program is brought to you by Diet Coke. Um, but let's start off with a prayer. In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just ask that as we enter into the scriptures, that our hearts may be illuminated, that we may learn to walk your path, that in these trying times, that our hearts may ever rest in your love. We ask all of this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You know, it just occurred to me I, uh, I was, as I was praying with this and reflecting on it. So immediately before the flight of Egypt is the visit, visit of the Magi. And let's see. Yeah, so immediately after that is the flight to Egypt. So the first point I want to talk about a little bit is beware when God is giving you good things, right? Like, it, it not beware, but like be prepared. Like it's almost like right before they go on, they go to Egypt, God gives them everything they're going to need to persevere. Right. So they got a little bit of cash in the bank. They got a little bit of, you know, stuff like that. Is that, is that, is that making sense? It does make sense because God provides for our needs and sometimes in ways that we don't understand and, and in ways that we can't really foresee, but it gives us the ability to respond um, properly to our mission in the next moment. Yeah. So I really th agree with, with what you're saying. It's, it's important. And I really think that the flight into Egypt that we're going to be talking about today really has some profound implications for what we're dealing with right now. So I'm really excited to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and I think also, I mean, there's a sense that, um, it's, it's interesting that the, so saying nations has the insight that when you're in a consolation, prepare for a desolation. So prepare for the next trial, uh, try to anticipate. And of course you can't always anticipate what your next trial is going to be. Some of the things that have popped up the past few weeks have been a little surprising. Um, the trials, not what I would have expected. Um, but what I found is, is that you always have the grace that you're needed if you learn to respond well. Now, I will say this. It doesn't mean that you don't experience negative emotions. I think that's one thing that I'm learning as I get older is that you will always have the full gamut of emotions. There will always be moments of sadness. There'll be always moments of anger. There'll be moments of frustration. But God provides you the way out. He, he teaches you how to, how to work through that stuff if you're growing in wisdom. Um, but I think about this is just think about that. I mean, the next time, and I think it's a good thing to remember is the next time things are going really well, think to yourself, a dark day will come. Like there will be a struggle. There will be a crisis. There will be something that happens. Right. Yeah. But also not to dwell on that. Yeah. I have a, so when, when you're dealing with anxiety, sometimes it's also like things are going a little bit too well. When is the next, you know what I mean? Like, where's the cross, you know, like trying to prepare for the cross in some way where sometimes that can lead to higher anxiety and not so much trust in the Lord. So I really think that a balance in that, yes, it's right to be prepared and to be looking forward and, and know that there will be trials, right. Mm -hmm. But not necessarily to have anxiety about it and to really focus on that. You know, focus on Christ, keep your eyes on Christ, know that there will be crosses, but not to despair and not to like constantly be on the lookout in fear of the next thing. You know what I mean? Like, oh, it's going so well. What's ha what's going to happen next? You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to fall really hard. It's, it's definitely a stumbling block for those with anxiety from a personal perspective of, of how sometimes I, ha I have to like stop myself from having these anxieties on of like, Oh, things are going good. What's going to happen? You know what I mean? Like, Oh no, what yeah. does this mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily mean anything, but also just be prepared. Yeah. And, and, and this where maybe a little bit to add a little bit of caveats is there's an element of know thyself. So different kinds of temperaments, different kinds of personalities. I'm the go lucky type. So, I mean, like when I'm feeling good and when things are going well, I'm not particularly fearful of the future. And so I'm the type of person that maybe needs a little bit more introspection, 
a little bit more, hey, prepare for a dark day. Now, if you're the type that overthinks, just kind of being aware. And, and also, I mean, looking, like I've talked about this a lot is, what time of day are we talking about? What, what's the context of the thought, right? So for example, at 9 p.m. on a Friday night, you should not necessarily be worrying about your bills. 9 a.m. on Monday morning, maybe. Or you know, 10 a.m. on Saturday when you have free time with your wife, there's a good time or husband, there's a good time to be meditating and reflecting on your finances, but like not 11 p.m. on a Friday night or 11 p.m. on a Sunday night or whatever it might be. Um, and that's often something to consider is the context of the thought as well, um, which is such a huge integral part of, 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 um, of discernment. Now, I think it's just, it is really fascinating when you really think about the flight of Egypt and the fact that they just suddenly got like a ton of gold. They had a lot of incense, which would have been like a great for bartering and trading. Um, and they got a lot of stuff that that's going to prepare them for, uh, for their flight. All right, let's get into it. Yeah. All right, so we're verse 13. 13, chapter 2. When they departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take up the child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you. Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. Um, you know, I think that's a good place to stop. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So just the fact that he's received this message from an angel. I think one of the important things to realize is. I'm not sure how or why or how, how it would look, but I don't believe, I, I can't believe that this is the first time that St. Joseph has felt the Lord speak. To him. Now, maybe it's the first time he's had a vision with an angel. Maybe, um, maybe not, but I have to believe that he's learned to hear the Holy Spirit for years before that. Like so much of his heart has been prepared that he recognizes this as authentic, if that makes sense. Yeah, and he and it's they've just re- literally received these gifts. So when they had departed, that means when the magi departed. Yeah, because the, the, the verse right before it says that they de- departed for their country by another way. So it was immediately they received these gifts, and then they needed to act. So so like you were saying before, like we really have to be aware when we receive the gifts, that we will be called into mission immediately, that we will be called to use these things for God, the um, intentions that God has for us. Um, so, so I really there's kind of a funny a way, there's kind of a funny way this plays out in my life. So one of the things I've, I've learned as I get older, um, as a priest, is that I can be called to do anointings at any time, right? So there's a sense that, um, you know, maybe within reason, somebody could go to a party and have three or four beers might be a little excessive, maybe not. But what I found is, is I always have to be careful that I don't get too tired at a party or get too tired. And there's a sense of the, the sobriety that's required that be sober and awake kind of idea, be awake, you know, not the hour. I mean, can you imagine like, like, let's say Mary just for like, man, we got like a million dollars now. Let's, 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 let's go, let's go party, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, I'm being a little silly, but 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 there's a sense that they that they're not either intoxicated in the sense of security, emotionally intoxicated, but also literally that they're sober and ready to go, that they're ready to go at a moment's notice. Um, and we'll focus on Joseph a little bit, but that he didn't he didn't um, his prosperity did not make him slow, did not make him unresponsive, mm. which is often the opposite sometimes with us, right? Right. And especially when, when things come unexpected, like gifts, we can be taken off guard and then, and not being paying attention. Even just, even if we were before in that moment, we could, you know, not be really focused on, on God in that moment of, of reception of, of gifts. Have you you found right now, I just had a thought. Have you found that there's a lot of people who are not, um, how do I put this? They're only reacting. They're not being proactive. Like, um, and, and as a consequence, they're like, for example, I mean, I would tell everybody right now, every pastor, every parish is, you got to have a plan for Holy Week. And you got to be thinking about that like today, you know? Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's critical that you start talking about that. I, I mean, think not you personally, but you know what I'm saying? Like, right. And that's just on the parish level, but like restaurants too. I mean, I think three or four days ago, if, if I was in the restaurant business, I'd have been like, hey guys, we're in the delivery business now. 
you know, mm-hmm. I would yeah. have been finding ways of trying to. Right. And, and I think that's important in, in our diocese, we, from like where I'm engaged, uh, like all of the DREs got together on a Zoom call, you know, a few Zoom meetings to be able to come together and try to discuss and, and figure out how to deal with this problem of distance learning from a, a religious education perspective. Um, so I, I definitely think that there are people who are engaged in that way, maybe not so much in a public sense that everyone would know. Um, but I think that there are two different, there are definitely the spectrum of people who are just reacting. And then there are people who are being engaged and really trying to meet this problem head on. Um, and they are, these are, will be the ones who succeed, not, not just the reacting ones, but the ones who are really working on, on looking at the reality of what we're dealing with and, and try to project into the future, like, okay, what will we need to do? How can we survive this? Yeah. Um, I just think about the timeline with Joseph, right? He literally just had the Magi there. They're entertaining people. They got a ton of money. They're like excited. Bam, get up and go. Mm-hmm. I mean, just that readiness. Like, I think that's the, the thing we, like, uh, we got to cultivate. Um, and that spiritual readiness. Yeah. Um, and, 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 um, and I mean, think about the, the time frame. Now, I will say this also, this is where I think right now systems and groups are being challenged. And we're going to get into this with Mary is, so there's his relationship with God and there's his relationship with Mary. Right. And you really got to believe that there's a strong foundation there, that it's not, the, it's, uh, yeah, there's a strong foundation there. Yeah. And, and, that, and in this particular verse, I, I want to really dig into, he had a dream and, and it says, rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there until I tell you. They had to rise and flee from the temple from their normal worship yeah for their own safety that's a great point so this is what kind of what came to me this morning when i was really contemplating like what what does the flight of egypt mean to us in this moment right now in this moment where we can't be in our own worship spaces and doing what god has asked us to remember to do and how do we look to the holy family in times like this and and how did they respond to danger to themselves and what did God ask them to do? God asked them to flee to Egypt until he told them it was, it was time to come back. Mm-hmm. And they obeyed. And they, they didn't say, oh, well, God will spare me because, you know, this is the son of God. So I don't have to, I don't have to go anywhere because I want to I do what God has told me to do in the temple. So I really, because I think that that's a, a real struggle in our, from what I'm seeing on social media and stuff is like, the struggle of being away from mass, the struggle of being asked to not receive. Um, and what does that mean for us? You know what I mean? And how, do, how can we look at this and say, okay, the Lord had to take time away from the temple for his own safety. Yeah. And there's a certain sense wasn't able to fulfill the law. Right. They were in Egypt. But because he was following the will of God in obedience of faith, through his parents, through the, through the authority of his parents and through this um, divine revelation to Joseph, they were fulfilling God's law because it transcends, Mm -hmm. you know, the law of Moses. So, because they never sinned. So, so we have to also look at that, that it was not a sin for them to, to not be able to fulfill the law in Egypt. And I actually never thought about that before until this very second. I was like, oh my gosh, because they weren't, because Mary didn't ever sin, but she also, they also weren't able to fulfill those law, that particular part of the law in that time of their lives. But that was, it was always understood that, that, that certain parts of the law could be set aside in times of crisis. This is where Jesus upbraids the, the, the Pharisees and the scribes, right? So David eats the show bread things like this. Um, mm-hmm. um, and, yeah. and yeah, so on the Sabbath, doing those work miracles on the Sabbath, on yeah. the Sabbath, um, how those laws are, are put aside to bring life to the people because the miracles of Jesus are what is bringing life to people. And that's what the Sabbath is all about. It's about uh, resting in life of, in, yeah. in God. So yeah. and I mean, clearly in Jesus also 
I mean, he's making a point when he does that because even the Pharisees pick up on the fact, well, I mean, if you're so powerful, you could just wait a day so they come back tomorrow. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's a, really, that's a really fascinating. The things that start to come out with scripture when you start to realize it. I mean, they basically have to go live among a pagan people and not be able to worship God in the temple and not be able to worship in the synagogue. Now, there's probably some Jewish communities there that they could connect with because of the diaspora. But even then, I mean, but still not the same. Right. And that's part of the, you know, um, that's part of the Psalms, right? How can we uh, sing? How can we sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? Um, have you heard that? Have you heard that version by uh, Sublime? Uh, by the rivers of Babylon. Mm-hmm. It's a great song. I have to, <laughs> Send it to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but, I mean, but that was part of the, the whole idea of that Psalm was like, they're in, they're in exile and they're longing for the temple. Right. And it also brings us to the domestic church. The Holy family is the domestic, you know, the origins of the domestic church. Yeah. And just because they weren't at the actual temple doesn't mean they weren't with Christ. Who is the, who is the temple? Yeah. So, so it's, it's really interesting also to, to contemplate on that and how, even if we can't go into the building of the church, that we are the church. Mm-hmm. We are the body of Christ. We together have the sacraments, you know, the, the, we have been chrismed into the life of Christ. And we really need to rest in, in that knowledge mm-hmm. that, that we do not need to disp- despair in times like these, mm-hmm. um, that, that we have hope even if we can't physically be in yeah. front of the Eucharist. Which is fascinating because um, you haven't, at this point, you haven't set foot inside a church in what, a week? It's been a week, yeah. A week. That's interesting. So, See, I, that's one thing I can't, um, it has been well, pointed out. A little out less than me. a week. We, we were able to have mass on Sunday right. and it was cut off right, cut off right after. So. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, so this will be the first Sunday the year. And it's fascinating, even like preparing for homilies. I'm like, wait a minute, I'm literally not going to see anybody this weekend. I'll have mass and I'll live stream it, but then getting used to the fact that I, I won't see that many people. Right. Uh, which, which has been kind of interesting for me because I'm used to seeing like hundreds and hundreds of people. And now suddenly I'm only seeing like 10 or five, yeah. you know, uh, like yeah. just a few different people. But, um, yeah, well, it's it's really interesting because that that lay perspective. I don't see it's tough right now. I don't know what I would have done as a lay person in this circumstance. So I'm trying to be patient with with people who are having some extreme reactions. I don't know what kind of reaction I would have had. Now I will say that one of the things that I think is a, a little bit unique experience for me is that I did question authority a lot in high school and middle school or middle school, high school, and college. And I was kind of anti-authoritarian. And when I came back to the faith, I kind of swung the other way of, of respecting and trusting authority. And I think one of the things that um, has been really brought out by this crisis is your relationship with authority. Um, and I think we can even start to talk about that a little bit with the Blessed Virgin Mary. How, how, how did she handle the authority of Joseph? Now, before anybody gets crazy, like, even if you think right now that women should be equal to men or however you want to interpret that, which I believe women are equal to men. I'm not saying I don't believe that. At the time of Mary and Joseph, the man was the head of the household. That's an irrefutable fact. Whether that's good, bad, indifferent, it's just the way it is. So how did the Blessed Virgin Mary approach the authority of, of Joseph? I think that's an interesting question because, I mean, a certain part she would have, I think she would have understood her specialness and uniqueness, like we hear in the Magnificat, but yet she was willing to submit to an authority that was imperfect. And even more so the, um, the temple, the, the priests, I don't think people that, I don't think you were naive. I think there, the corruption, there's always a certain amount of corruption as I've pointed out before, but I think they would have recognized but yet they still they still were somewhat obedient to the authorities, right? And then yeah. imagine after the crucifixion and things like that. Yeah. And I think it is hard right now with all of the scandal going on um, and, and to really 
it, it's a time to like reinstate our trust in that as laity that the priests are praying for us and the priests are saying mass for us and and we have to depend on that right now which is scary because of this a little bit of a a crack in the trust of mm -hmm. of the hierarchy and of you know like who can we trust and and it really is forcing us to rely on you as you know as laity for and rely on the priesthood to pray for us and on our behalf and to really realize that that's what you do for us even when we're there um mm -hmm. so that hasn't necessarily changed but our physical presence just isn't there right now um and to just recognize that that is a part of trusting god and part of trusting you know how the church works um and and i think that that is part of the response of people being frustrated and and not agreeing with what's going you know how people are handling this whether you agree they're handling it well or not not well at all it's not something that we've ever dealt with or really been prepared for so i think there also has to be a, a decent amount of forgiveness and understanding that this is not something that people go into priesthood to deal with mm -hmm. you know um it's just different we all have but to that, have that's a what, lot of forgiveness for say. each other that's what I'm going to say. I'm going to definitely work this into future like formation. If I ever get, if I'm ever involved with the formation of priests and seminarians is we should be formed for this kind of things. Crisis is crisis is a part of leadership and management. You know, yeah. I think, I mean, I understand some priests feel that they weren't prepared adequately for this um, perhaps, but there's definitely, we have to, we have to take that leadership and management stance, but I, I get what you're saying. Being yeah. patient with being patient with leaders right now. Um, one of the things I've, I've, I've found the greatest challenge for me in this crisis, and I've alluded to this many times, is being willing to just have people mad at me. Like, it's been fortunate. My parishioners, it's interesting. The people who've been the least mad and least judgmental are the people who are closest to me, like day to day, um, which I, I find great comfort in that, that, that there is something about the way I've been forming my, my community for the past three years that I think... That they trust you. They trust me and I feel like they're prepared. Like, I feel like they're prepared for this. Right. Like this. And sometimes, like, there's nothing that can compare to you for some things. You have to trust in God. And that's part of the trust element. And, you know, trust that God has prepared things for you and also is working through the prayers of the priests. And also, if the laity, if you're complaining more than you're praying for these people, then this is a part of the problem. Like we need to pray for these people more than we complain about them. And yeah. And I, and I would, even, I would take another step and this is where I've been very proud of our parishioners and I don't want to take all the credit. I don't think it obviously predates me and it's deeper with the people is everybody right now is being incredibly proactive in Greenville. Um, everybody is, I mean, I just got, I mean, it's, it's kind of tiring for me because everybody's coming up with ideas, but I just got a text message yesterday about let's do a rosary on Sunday uh, international rosary I was talking to you about I got a message this morning hey what about a school mass let's do a school mass for the kids so they can watch digitally all these things they're like I want to say there's excitement but it kind of is I mean it's that fight or flight mechanism where people mm -hmm. are like taking that energy taking that fear that anxiety and transforming it into an excitement and let's get things done really I really think like what you just said is also if they're feeling the grace like the grace is being poured out and energizing people and they're they're responding to it which is that's what's exciting to me is that people are feeling grace and responding to it and making things happen and that is very exciting even in a time of fear and even in a time of unknown that there's grace and there are people who are responding positively to that grace and not rejecting it is it gives me so much hope Absolutely. in in how we're dealing with this and giving us tools to to deal with the future because this is all giving us tools to help us um be resilient in the future absolutely absolutely so. and we have so many things i don't know about your community but people are gathering food we're getting food together we're getting like just being proactive um, yeah yeah which... and it's and it so there's a lot of hope there's a lot of uncertainty and fear but at the other end there's also a lot of hope i, I think now and it's a moment like this though I think it really draws out those who have been investing in people 
and have really healthy, vibrant relationships. I think that's what's being drawn out by this because I've seen it now on social media. There's a few people that over the years that they, their social media presence probably points to their daily lives and they even refer to their daily lives where they feel isolated. All they do is sit and complain, their armchair quarterback kind of mentality. And even whether I agree or disagree with a few of my disagree, a few I agree, whatever it might be. Um, at a time like this, they're completely frozen because you can't complain your way out of this situation. It doesn't matter how much you complain. We're going to have to wake up with it tomorrow and for the next few weeks. The proactive people, the people who have solid relationships, they're reaching out. They're like, what can I do? What can we do? Who's the vulnerable? Who's the weak? Who's going to need us? It's, it's also forcing people to be the domestic church. It's also forcing people to recognize how important the family time is and how our time is formed around them. Um, so it's, you know, like being part, like talking about this, it's really necessary for, for us who do have this proactive sense to also be engaging with those people who need the formation of domestic church. And how do we how do we help them in this situation? But allow them to do it. They have to do it. Everyone who is in the domestic church needs to figure it out in your own situation because every every family is a little bit different and our needs are different. But in this time for us to be strong as a church, as the body of Christ, the domestic church needs to be built up. And the understanding of, of how important that is is really I mean, people have been saying it for a long time, but haven't really been able to like make it reality in understanding. Um, So now this is the time to say, all right, domestic church, you're on. Yeah. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. All right. Let's, let's continue on. So I think actually we might cut it short at like 45 because we're, we're, we're milking this one. It's only like three lines. We're milking it for, all right. So Joseph, rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed for egypt um i i want to i'd be curious um the 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 wife's perspective mary like Mm -hmm. joseph wakes up and says grab the child we have to go like i think right now i I would be curious to see how marriages are doing or relationships or institutions where they had poor communication right because that's what i've realized is you got to invest and, and it's actually funny. One of the things, one of the theories I have on how to invest in other people is developing conversations that are not just problem solving. I've realized that if I, if I had to do some counseling with couples, um, which I probably will do in the coming years, if, if their communication is troubled, okay, let's set aside the problems. Let's set aside the things that you don't like about each other. How do you view Satan? Like, what do you, like, use your imagination. Like, how do you view Satan? How do you feel the, the exercise of St. Ignatius? So I'm kind of alluding to, how do you view the fall of Adam and Eve? Like, not like blaming anybody else. Just how do you, like, in having that conversation. But I realize is if you're not having those conversations before, now, right now, there's probably going to be a great strain. Now, there's also, fortunately, I think there's time to have some of those conversations. But, um I'm realizing that if you didn't invest, if you didn't invest in those relationships before, it's going to be, it it can be difficult. And something actually that that the last few days I've been concerned about and and praying for people who are in difficult marriage situations or uh, living situations where there is domestic violence. um, This is a very difficult situation and they could probably be in, in much more danger in this, in this particular situation. And how do we help them? Um, obviously praying for them, but, but also sharing resources necessary to, um, help them in this situation. Um, because not everyone is a Joseph and not everyone is a Mary. And, and we really need to look at the reality of that, but from a a spouse's perspective, like really, is a great Mary is is the model of the church mm-hmm. and and she responds to the authority of her husband and and re, we as the church uh need to re- also respond to the authority in in obedience of faith so i really think that there's a lot of grace that comes through that it's hard mm-hmm. i mean was it easy for her 
in her lack of sin, it might have been easier, but not actually physically easy. Like she just had a, a child and now she has to travel far into an unknown land and, and really through grace and through trusting God um, and trusting the discernment of her husband. And, and on, you know, today that we're recording, this is the Feast of St. Joseph, but really understand, like trusting like the Lord picked St. Joseph for a reason and that his discernment is necessary and how, how we really need to rely on the discernment of those who, who have authority over us. And sometimes it's, you know, they make, you know, human, human people make mistakes. Um, so our current authority, you know, we have to the trust that God will give us the grace through our obedience to, to really like move forward with what's necessary in the world today. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of how I feel about it. Here's about some that. question for you. What if, what if Joseph, you know, not, not being without sin, what if part of the way he handled some of these things was not perfect, right? And, and imagine the Blessed Virgin Mary being patient with that, right? So we don't know how he told the Blessed Virgin Mary that they needed to go, right? Mm-hmm. So that's one area. He could have communicated it poorly, but she was patient with it. Mm-hmm. Um, so first of all, being patient when your leaders don't communicate things the way they should be. Let's say he didn't manage things well, like their money or like just made some mistakes, you know, paid mm-hmm. too much for a donkey or whatever. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I also, I also want to look at, but yeah. those are the little things where people really start to, because I mean, as a leader, you get, you know, you get all kind of nitpicky, right? You paid, I mean, this is not crisis stuff, but you paid a thousand for that crucifix. I could have got it for 500. You paid this for that, you know? Right. And, and I think there's a sense that, that trusting authority, even in the midst of imperfection. Right. And, and it's not like they were just in, re- that they're new to this relationship with each other. She had to tell him that she got a message from an angel that she was pregnant. He had to tell her, I had a dream with a message from, from an angel. And this is what we're supposed to name our child. And, and that I shouldn't be afraid to take you as my wife. And so this is not their first encounter with an angel to know, to trust, you know, so, so they, through the, the, through the pedagogy of even their life with, with God, that they're, they've learned to trust in this way. Like, this is something that I can trust Mm -hmm. and I can respond to quickly. Like we said before, you were, you've been talking about like the baseball mentality of like the, the fastballs. Like sometimes you just need to be prepared to respond quickly. And this is how they've been trained to respond quickly. They've already had these experiences of discernment. And then they know in that moment that this is what God is asking them to do. And so I think that that's also important that for our leaders, that they do have this training in discernment to be able to respond well quickly. Absolutely. And, and for us as well to, to recognize that we don't always respond well, we're not always well trained in discernment for these things. And that sometimes our immediate responses aren't always the correct ones. You know, like sometimes our opinions aren't always the right ones. The right ones in these moments, um, and it's okay to have those negative thoughts, and it's okay to have some anxiety about it, but to really trust in God in these moments, like it seems so simple, but it's so profound in in our need. You know, the divine mercy is trust Jesus. I trust in you. That was given to us for these times, for these times of anxiety and unknown, to really lean on Christ. Absolutely. So that's some great stuff. That's awesome. Heck yeah, man. Um, cool. Well, I think, I think this might be actually a good place maybe to stop a little bit. I think this has been a good conversation. I think um, we'll continue to talk. I got some things now. I just realized when you said it, it's the Feast of St. Joseph. Yeah. Like, so I'm going to be talking more about this and mass um, in a little bit. So we got mass at uh, 12 and I got to, I got to connect with everybody and get organized a little bit. I'm thinking maybe we'll keep this maybe a half hour a day. Maybe might be better. I like the idea of an hour, but it just might not be possible with schedules and everything. And content, but, you know, sometimes a little bit less is, is good. Yeah, exactly. And so. I'll be able to post it. But well, thanks so much, Alana. Good to see Thank everyone. Um, th- just keep tuning in. We're, I mean, 
we don't know how long we're going to be doing this, but we're, we're prepared. We're ready. We're being proactive. All right. Thanks, Alana. Mm -hmm.